Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the Peregrine Falcon Education Webinar today. Uh, my name is Madeline Champlin. I am the Education Program Manager for the New Hampshire Audubon Massachusetts Center in Auburn, New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire Audubon is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to help protect New Hampshire's natural environment for wildlife and for people. Two of the ways we do that is through education and conservation. Um, in the fall, New Hampshire Audubon wanted to try a new education program that combines education and conservation. This program became Learning as Scientists, Students Monitoring Peregrine Falcons in Manchester. This project, uh, this program uh, was made possible by funding from the Door Foundation. And this project provides students the opportunity to monitor a peregrine falcon pair um, at the Brady Sullivan Tower in Manchester, New Hampshire during their breeding season. The students get to meet and talk to a real scientist and through observations and project-based learning, the students get to think and learn like a scientist and while, lear and, and while learning about peregrine falcons. In order for this project to happen, New Hampshire Audubon needed to find a school to help us pilot the program with us. And so we decided, we chose Hooks at Memorial School. Uh, we chose a fifth grade team from Hooks at Memorial School. Um, and this team is made up by three teachers and two classes of about 20 students each. So New Hampshire Audubon and the Hooks at Memorial teachers uh, wanted to come together today for uh, a Peregrine Falcon education webinar um, as a way to show the students that we're still thinking of them during their remote learning. Today, I am joined by Chris Martin, who is the senior raptor biologist for New Hampshire Audubon. Um, I'm also joined by three of the Hooks at Memorial teachers, uh, Mrs. Brotherson, Mrs. Githmark, and Mrs. Tremblay. So today, we'll start with Chris Martin, who will give a review of some of the peregrine falcon um, behaviors that we've been seeing the last few months at the Brady Sullivan Tower in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, also, some of the students have been writing questions down um, throughout the program and the and Mrs. Gifmark and Mrs. Trent and Mrs. Brotherson will be reading these questions for Chris to answer. At the end of our webinar, uh, Mrs. Tremblay will share some student quotes from some of the projects um, and assignments the students have been working on um, throughout the program. All right, uh, again, thank you for joining the Peregrine Falcon Education webinar. And now I'll pass things off to Chris Martin. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, you remember me from a couple months ago? I came to give a program at uh, the school, which was a lot of fun. And I enjoyed meeting everybody. Um, let's see. Today, we're going to um, catch up on what the, the Falcons have been doing in Manchester. And I know that a lot of you have been following them on video. And uh, it's been exciting to see them go through uh, courtship. Um, if we think way back to February, there's been some interesting things that have gone on. We were anxiously waiting for the birds to uh, get to the point of laying their eggs, and, which they finally did. When was that? That was about, started about the 24th of March. And if you're watching closely, um, you might have noticed that they were laying uh, an egg about every two and a half days. It took them from 24th of March to the 3rd of April to complete their clutch of five eggs. I actually have a picture of that here somewhere, which I'd like to share with you. If I can just find it. Can everybody see this? This is uh, the falcons, the female falcon, uh, when she finally had laid five eggs. There's one, two, three, four, and way in the back is number five. Uh, these guys have laid five eggs um, mo um, about a third of the time in all the years that they've been there, nearly 20 years now. Sometimes they lay just four, but uh, five is not unusual. And we'll have to see if all five of those eggs hatch. Something to think about is uh, when will they hatch? It takes about five weeks or 35 days for the eggs to mature and hatch. But 
um, remember they started incubating after egg number one or two and it took another several days for eggs three, four, and five to come out. So those eggs presumably weren't developing until, until that point. So they will probably not all hatch at the same time. And we'll, ha we'll be wondering from day to day how many eggs are gonna make it. Okay, how am I doing? Everybody hear me okay? All right, I just wanna make sure. So, um, just before they laid eggs, there was an interesting event that some of you might have seen. Um, remember, this is on a, a building with lots of activity and lots of telecommunications um, gear on the top of the building on the roof. And two days before the first egg was laid, uh, the birds were all upset on a Saturday morning, I believe it was, uh, by a construction crane that appeared on camera right in front of the nest box. And uh, the adults were off out of the box for about an hour, flying around, vocalizing, and clearly were upset. Uh, apparently a, uh, a contractor was installing some uh, equipment on the roof of the building. And uh, they were uh, not aware that there were peregrines nesting there. So that was a surprise when that happened. And uh, then we've also had other interesting events like a visit in February by an unknown stranger uh, uh, to the box. Let's see if I can find that one. Let's see. I'm having a little more trouble now. So here's a video of this uh, surprise visit by uh, a strange peregrine that doesn't belong there. Look at, look at, look at its behavior. Is it different than what we see with our resident birds? It seems to be nervous and uneasy. And I'm going to pull ahead. Oh, this is the spot. This is a, it's a color banded bird. So we know it's a different bird. It has two leg bands. When it hops into the box, you should be able to see those leg bands. Um, hard to see at that distance, but it should come in here. There we go. Check this out. See the leg bands? That's not uh, one of our two unbanded adult birds. It's also very white chested, different than, than either the male or female uh, that we're familiar with. This bird was checking things out, wondering if this would be a good place for it to be. Um, we've never seen it again since, so I suspect that the adults um, chased it away and said, no, thank you, don't stay in our town. Let's go find someplace else to live. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, that's the beauty of this camera that's running all the time is we find, we see all kinds of interesting things. So that's enough of that one. Um, there, oh, there's, there's a lot more I could share with you. Let's see what else I can come up with here. I love this one. I've got food, I've got food. It's all for you. Some really interesting behavior here. The male backs into the corner, is acting really uh, sort of submissive, head down. She's such a big bird. She, she, could, she could do some damage to him if she wanted to, but she doesn't. She just wants that food. Now watch the head bobbing and all this courtship. Look at, look at that. This, this occurred before they laid eggs. They were still uh, in courtship and still uh, in the process of mating. And uh, just amazing. You wonder what they're saying to each other there, huh? All right, I'm going to stop this, but it's just so much fun to watch these videos.
so what let's see what's what's next let's see if i can get back to a full screen here so uh we're in the middle of incubation right now for the peregrines they've uh um been incubating the eggs since uh very first part of april end of march and uh the way we calculate it uh, the eggs should be hatching sometime between the very end of april and the end of the first week of may as i said before not all at one time um, and uh, it takes the young chicks six weeks to start flying so you can work out for yourself when uh, they might start flying from that nest box for the first time. That'll be, uh, uh, again, considerably later than, than hatch time. What's really interesting though, is to see what happens when they start getting used to using their legs and start hopping around the box and realize that there's a front porch out there in front of the box that they can go out on and be the first first when food comes in, first one to the food. Um, the problem is when they jump down there, they have trouble getting back up into the box again. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that behavior works, especially if there are as many as five young, downy, white peregrine chicks in that box at once. Um, looking forward to that. You'll still be uh, in school at that point, right? At the end of At the end of May. So that should be a great way to cap off the year uh, with those young birds uh, uh, developing and getting ready to fly. So um, I don't know. So uh, I know we have some questions that we can get to at some point here. You've been uh, watching this for a while and it seems like everybody's got some really good uh, questions and thoughts about what they'd like to know about peregrines. And I'd love to get to that when the time is right. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a lot of wonderful information. So now we're going to turn to Mrs. Brotherson and Mrs. Giftmark, who have some student questions um, from some of their fifth grade students who have been watching um, the Peregrines at the Brady Sullivan Tower in Manchester. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Brotherson and Mrs. Giftmark. Okay. All right, thanks, Madeline. We have a question from students. Um, what are the most common foods that the peregrine falcons eat? Well, peregrines are bird eaters uh, primarily. Uh, they eat all sorts of medium-sized uh, birds, um, some that they catch in migration, some that they catch because they live around the area. Probably the biggest thing they eat with any regularity is um, uh, pigeons, which are very common in cities. Um, not so common in, in wilderness settings, uh, but everything from the size of, say, uh, a sparrow up to the size of a pigeon or even a small duck. Um, we've actually collected a lot of the feathers from the uh, Brady Sullivan Tower nest box over the years and found um, lots of blue jays, lots of uh, starlings, pigeons, um, but some surprises, things like uh, uh, cuckoos, which you wouldn't think about as being a city bird, but they're around. Uh, flickers, which are a woodpecker. Um, and at certain times of the year during peak of migration, they catch things like American woodcock, which are not something you would expect to be seeing in the city very much, but they're very vulnerable when they're in migration. They're not fast flyers. And they're kind of tired because they've been flying a long way. The peregrines cue in on that. They recognize a vulnerable prey item, a bird, and go after it. Um, sometimes they'll eat unusual things. They do catch dragonflies, and the chicks, when they start flying, chase dragonflies as a, something they can easily go after. Uh, not a very dangerous thing to, to, to chase because it's not big and bulky and it can't really hurt the falcon. But uh, but they are they are difficult to catch and uh, the the young birds when they're first starting out um, look pretty goofy trying to catch dragonflies uh, moths are another thing and then 
Um, we've also seen them bring in some very unusual things to the nest box. I think I've got a video here somewhere that um, will show. Where is that video? Okay, so here's a video of a very unusual item that was brought in, uh, I think in early March. Check this out. Look at that, it's actually a mammal with wings. It's a bat. So the male brought in a bat that was migrating in the daytime. A lot of um, little brown bats are migratory. And so they're migrating through the state, heading back to where they spend the summer. And this peregrine picked up on that slow flying bat, caught it and brought it back to the female. Here she comes back around. She's going to um, have a little bit of the snack on, on the perch out here. I know she's out there. She's gonna come back in a second. She's still got it, see? I wonder what a bat tastes like. Pretty amazing. So um, bats are very unusual prey items uh, for peregrines, but um, but the, it is well known that, that they'll catch bats. And in cities where there's light, even at night, um, in the summer, bats are flying around and they certainly are vulnerable uh, to being caught by uh, peregrine falcons and eaten. So while they're bird specialists, they don't always just eat birds, okay? So, Chris, another question from students was um, they saw a lot of the meals that the falcons were having and they, it looks like they eat every piece of the bird, except maybe the feet. Um, so they were wondering, um, do they eat every piece and even the bones? <clears throat> well, um, they don't eat every piece. A lot of times we'll find uh, the wings. Uh, below a peregrine nest site. So they'll eat all of the body and uh, the, the males uh, oftentimes will uh, actually bite off the head of a bird and eat the inside of the head, the brains, which are very rich in nutrition. Isn't that a lovely sound thing to think about? Um, uh, but they'll bring back a beheaded carcass to the uh, female. The, the males do do most of the hunting in peregrines, and uh, the females usually take the items that the males offer, and if they want to, they'll do what we call caching. They will store it in a secret spot or two that they have somewhere around the building, a little nook or cranny, and then they come back to it when the weather's bad and there's no food available. They can go back and get that supply. So to answer your question, though, um, they digest, they, they, they consume most all of the feathers and bones um, along with the meat, uh, but it goes into their crop and is di digested in their, in basically in their throat and then passed on to their stomach for further digestion. Then they do something called uh, uh, coughing up pellets. Um, a lot of the undigestible items like beaks and bone parts and a lot of the feathers actually come back up um, in a compact pellet that they spit out uh, and you'll see them working pellets up. They actually see them bobbing their head multiple times. Uh, eventually um, they'll cough up this inch long pellet and out it'll go and down over the edge of the building and someone's standing down there look out. 
Um, these are, they're lightweight, but um, they're um, a way to get rid of the non-digestible parts without passing it through your entire digestive system. Great. Okay. Next question from a student. How many times a day do the birds eat? Well, it, it varies with the you know, weather conditions and the time of year and what they're up to. Um, they probably eat about three times a day on average. Um, again, it depends if you're hunting for yourself or hunting for yourself and your mate, or if you're hunting for yourself and your mate and your five babies. Uh, the amount, the frequency that food gets delivered will vary. Um, but again, if you're catching large items like a pigeon, you might be able to get by on one meal a day. If you're catching small items like uh, goldfinches, which are, are really pretty lightweight and don't have a lot of uh, nutrition compared to a pigeon, you might have to catch four of them in a day to survive. So it depends on what they're eating. Okay, last uh, eating question from a student. Does the female eat more when she has the eggs in her belly or when she has no eggs? My hunch would be that she probably has a higher demand for food and energy when she is developing those eggs. So from uh, end of February through the month of March, almost certainly she's consuming more calories than assuming that she can find those and since she's relying on that uh, male to bring most of that food to her it's actually um, one of the ways that the male demonstrates that they're a good father is being able to provide food basically on demand so uh, it, definitely I think the food supply um, need is greatest when she is developing those eggs. Okay, on to the next set of questions about nesting. The children want to know, how do the falcons find a mate? That's a great question and it, it varies from place to place. They find a mate by going to a suitable place to live, like a cliff or a building, and spending time scanning the sky, looking for another falcon that might be passing by. Now, sometimes uh, it's a male that's looking for a mate. Sometimes it's a female that's looking for a mate. Um, they, uh, when they find another eligible falcon, they will do courtship flights and vocalizations and uh, try to make themselves look very attractive to that uh, other falcon. Sometimes they can impress a mate by bringing them food. And that indicates to the potential mate that this might be a great place to raise their, their young because there's food there and there is a, um, uh, a partner willing to join them in this effort. So uh, that's, that's really how they find a mate. And sometimes you'll see uh, multiple individuals at, a, at one site competing for the chance to use that as a nesting location. And okay. in the certain situations, it actually turns into uh, battles where uh, two males or two females will actually get into combat hmm. for the right to be at that location. And uh, they have to work it out through uh, chases and wrestling matches, literally which if you've seen their talent, you know that can be an interesting kind of thing to get involved in. Okay. All right. Do falcons mate more than once in a lifetime is another question. Well, there's a couple things here. One is finding a mate and being paired up with an, another bird. That oftentimes lasts for many years in a row, as long as those two birds are alive. Unless, of course, there's a, another rival that comes in and outcompetes one of those birds for the territory, as we just described a minute ago. Okay. Now, then there's the actual fertilizing and mating and having the eggs. That's that's this whole different definition of the word mating. And okay. I think some of you probably saw that these birds actually go through the process 
of fertilizing the female multiple times. Um, and uh, they can store that material in their bodies and then insert that into the egg before the shell goes on to fertilize the embryo. Okay, nice, thank you. That answered my next question. <laughs> Uh, on to the next question. Have you ever seen any other type of bird try to use the, ne the nesting falcon box? Well, this box has been around for a lot of years. And I remember one time we thought we had peregrines back in the 1990s and we put the box in place and it didn't work. No peregrines found the box and used it over the next couple of years. And at one point we had a pair of pigeons I decided to nest in that box, which is a wonderful, safe, secure, dry place for pigeons to nest. But considering it's also attractive to their main predator, excuse me, their main predator, it also seems like kind of a dumb place to nest. But um, that time we actually closed the box up for a year or two, put a cover on the front of it to discourage uh, the pigeons using it as a, as a habitual place to nest. But uh, since, since, uh, since 2000, we have not had anything else in that nest box except peregrine falcons. And though peregrines have used that nest box every year, except one year, we picked another sheep in downtown Manchester for reasons that we still don't quite understand. The following year, of course, they're back at this nest box again. And they've been there every year from 2000. Let's see. Uh, do you want to talk anything about uh, peregrines and their neighbors? Sure. Well, um, peregrine territories are pretty big. Sometimes they span three or four miles around the nest box, and they're not very often in those far flung regions, but at borders between the nest territory, times the peregrines have encounters with each other. Uh, our nearest neighbor to the Brady Sullivan uh, nest box is, is to the south, down the river, the direction you can see when you look out of the nest box, uh, about three miles to the 293-101 bridge on the south end of town, one of the ways you can get around to the mall or to the airport on the north side of Manchester. And at that site, uh, we have a pair of nesting under the bridge. And if you give me a second here, I think I can find you a picture of that pair. Uh, is that up on your screen now? Okay, good. This pair is uh, nesting on the 293-101 bridge. You're actually seeing them perching on the abutments of the bridge and the girders that support the roadbed. This pair has been around there for several years now. And they are also uh, incubating their eggs right now. Um, let's see if I can get you to that. We saw that we got this picture the other day on the 18th of, is that up where you can see it? This is a picture on the underneath side of the 293 bridge. We have, here's the bridge. We put a nesting tray in there instead of a nest box. It's simply a flat tray anchored to the bridge right here. And this picture is a little hard to tell what you're seeing, but what you're seeing is the feet and the body of the male just after he passed this prey item, which is a little bird, off to the female, which here's the female from her tail to her body to her head. So he just brought that food to the tray, gave it to her, and she's going to fly off to eat it somewhere else because in mid-March they didn't have eggs. But on the 31st of March, they started laying and incubating eggs at this tray. So we have a neighboring pair that's also trying to raise their babies. Okay? Great. Next set of questions are um, hatching questions. So a uh, student asks, do you know when a female, how do you know when a female is getting close to laying an egg? Well, her behavior changes a little bit. She seems to get 
um, more sedentary. She stays around the nest box much more frequently. She literally stands over a scrape, which is that hollow spot that they created to put the eggs in. She stands there oftentimes for long periods of time. And um, the feathers around the area where the egg comes out get all fluffed out. So you can actually see she has this sort of room of feathers that, uh, that looks really downy and she stands there. And eventually, I, was, I saw one of those eggs come out the other day. I was surprised at how it appears to take very little effort for those eggs to appear. Okay. It's a, quite a contrast to humans having babies, I would say. Um, and uh, one of the things is that the, the egg is still um, not fully developed and that egg is not ready to be a baby bird yet. It, the baby bird is not more than a tiny little speck inside that egg at that point. But um, that's the difference between birds and mammals is how they have their babies. Um, another question, is there an average for how many males or females are part of each brood of eggs? Well, there's an average for everything that you can count, but um, I'm not sure we know what is typical. Parents usually have very close to the same amounts of male and female babies. Ah. So uh, I guess that's the answer to that question is it's about 50-50. Hmm. If it's not exactly 50-50, um, I really don't know the answer to the question, but uh, it's very close to 50-50. I would suggest that we have that data available to uh, any student who really likes math could actually go back and look at our um, fledglings, find out what the sex of them were, and basically work back and figure out what the ratio of male to female babies has been. Good little student project. All right. Um, can you tell if the baby falcons are male or female when they're hatched? Is it how? No, no, no. You can't. They they all look the same. They're helpless, almost featherless, um, eyes closed, and about an inch long, and uh, but uh, you really can't tell at all. It takes about three weeks until the size differential begins to be obvious, um, and of course. They don't all hatch at once. So if a if a male is the first to hatch and a female is the fifth one to hatch and is about a week behind, relative size wise, they're gonna to be tough to tell apart even then. But if you can get them all at a certain age where you like uh, just before they fledge and leave the nest six weeks old, it's usually quite obvious then the larger females from the smaller males. Mm. And also our two adult birds, are very clearly different in size. You can tell the male from the female then, but when they hatch, you can't. Okay, last question. In the sad event that an egg doesn't hatch, um, what happens to it? And at the Brady Sullivan Tower nest, um, do scientists study it to see why it didn't hatch? Well, that is an opportunity for, uh, for learning and uh, as a habit, because we can get access to that site, we have been collecting those unhatched eggs. Oftentimes there are one or two each year that don't hatch. So maybe 20% of the eggs don't hatch. Um, over the years, uh, it, you know, it's easy to collect eggs from a, a nest box where you can actually walk up to the nest box and reach reach into the lid of the box and collect those eggs. It's not so easy to collect unhatched eggs from Franconia Notch, for example, uh, 400 feet up on a cliff. Think about what's involved in just getting to a spot like that. Um, but over the years, uh, we have collected um, dozens of parent falcon eggs that didn't hatch. Usually they're still sitting there when we band the babies at three weeks of age, even on cliff sites. They are, they're sitting there um, while the young chicks are growing. And we actually use that information to measure the sh shell thickness of the eggs because originally in the days when DDT was a problem, 
it was thin shells that were the, were the issue, yeah, thin, fragile shells. And so over the years, we've been sending the eggs to scientists that measure the shell thickness, and they have been telling us that these egg shells are now generally as thick as they were prior to the use of DDT back in beginning in the 1950s, which is a good sign. Uh, we've also used the contents of the eggs, the inside of the eggs, over the years of the unhatched eggs to analyze for certain chemicals, other chemicals besides DDT, including one flame retardant. Uh, they're called PBDEs, okay? And those, we have worked with our surrounding states and actually measured how much of that chemical is in peregrine falcons and published a scientific paper about that. Good. So that is all the questions we have right now. All right, I think, oops, do I want an intro or do I just go, Madeline, sorry. Okay, so um, we have done a little assignment with this. We've done many assignments with the students um, uh, with using the um, all the data that the Audubon has been collecting and Chris Martin. And what we did was we took a, we did a peregrine map assignment and they had a graph and they had to look at the graph and say that there were zero territorial birds in 1980. In 1984 and they had to think like a scientist and come up with one to two reasons that this happened so I'd like to share a couple of them because we were very impressed with your answers students and here we go so from Kaylee Kaylin sorry um, this could happen if the Falcons did not realize there was a nest for them or if two Falcons did not mate or find each other next up we have Kaylee, um, scientists were just starting to study this. Maybe there weren't as many scientists making observations or they hadn't located many falcons to observe yet. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, share two more. One is from Andrew and he says, in 1980, the falcons were almost extinct. In 1984, the graph showed the falcons were going down. And lastly, by Jonah. Here we go. There, they were an endangered species until the restoration began. Maybe their food source was low. So, what, what do you think about that, Chris? Well, I think uh, they're hitting around uh, the, the true answer um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, think about what it means to be an endangered species. It means you're rare, okay? You're not very common in the environment. And in fact, the first known nesting pair of peregrines in New Hampshire um, in recent years uh, occurred in 1981 uh, in Franconia Notch. Prior to that, the previous 10 years, there weren't any known nesting pairs anywhere in the state. And in fact, uh, scientists and other biologists were releasing captive raised baby peregrines into the wild to try to create a population, not only in New Hampshire, but in, in most other states across the country. So the reason that there were so few pairs then is there were very few peregrine falcons. And uh, the reason that population has grown over the years is that those few pairs that established have been successful in having babies, and those babies in turn have been successful in maturing and establishing territories of their own. Great. All right, thank you, Chris, for all your wonderful knowledge. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Brotherson and Mrs. Githmart for your questions or for your students' questions. Uh, I was really impressed. They have a lot of good questions. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Tremblay, for um, sharing some of those student quotes uh, with us. Uh, so now I'm going to give it back to Chris uh, for a few more minutes, and he is going to give us a little teaser for what's to come next. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you for uh, uh, joining us for this session uh, and for your thoughtful questions about peregrines and your interest in following them. I hope that uh, 
you're checking in on them every day to see what's going on at the nest site there and at the Brady Sullivan Tower. I'm looking forward to uh, joining you again in early May. I think our plan is for uh, to do it on May 7th, but at, at that point we should be uh, able to see some hatched baby peregrines, which will be really exciting. And uh, I suspect at that point you'll have more questions. So uh, keep a pencil and paper handy and jot down your questions and send them in to Mrs. Brotherson and Mrs. Githmark. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Enjoy the outdoors and enjoy our birds. Bye-bye. All right, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you everyone for being part of our Peregrine Falcon education webinar today. Um, I really enjoyed our conversations, the questions, um, and really what these students are getting out of this program uh, and this project. So again, this is um, Learning as Scientists, Students Monitoring Peregrine Falcons in Manchester. And this was made possible um, through the DOOR Foundation um, with their grant funding. Uh, and we look forward to continuing this um, program for the rest of the year. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you in May. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.